Good morning to everyone and uh, welcome to this Volumix event. Volumix is a project uh, funding by the Horizon 2020. And today we are going to have um, a very interesting uh, event in which we are going to talk about raising awareness about food system network dynamics, mainly focused on processes, tomatoes, food chain. And I'm going to read now all the rules of housekeeping that we have to, to commit during the whole, the whole event. Uh, so the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available on the Volumics website after the event. I would like to, to note that uh, please use the, the Q&A button only for questions and comments. And please write who you are, your question, and note which presenter you would like to address it uh, or state that is a general question. And uh, please uh, mainly uh, use English to write your comments and, and questions. So all the rules are very clear for, for all of us. So first of all, uh, my name is Eduardo Botillas and I'm the, the, the current uh, R&D director of the Spanish Food and Drink Federation called FIAP. And I'm very pleased to be with you uh, this, this morning. And uh, with me is uh, Concha Avila, who is the, uh, our project manager, who is uh, in charge of the project from, from FIAP. But today uh, our, our agenda is, is going to be very interesting because we have um, the, the participation of Celine Kidel. Celine is, uh, is one of the members of the European Commission and she belongs to the unit in wine, spirits and horticultural products from the DG Agri, from the European Commission. Thank you very much for being with us, uh, Celine. Afterwards, we're going to have um, Hilda Sigurdardotir. Hilda is uh, the marketing director of Marmac in Iceland and uh, she's going to speak about the understanding food value change. Thank you for being with, with us too, Hilda. Then we are going to have to Antonella Samoggia from the University of Bologna in Italy. She's going to speak about the Italian processed tomato food chain governance. Thank you very much too, Antonella, for being with us. And afterwards, we're going to have to Rosa de la Torre from CITAEX, that is a technological center of Extremadura in Spain. She's going to talk about the Spanish processes tomato food chain overview from the point of view of Spain. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, then we are going to have to Lucas Techura from the Czech University of Life Sciences in Prague in the Czech Republic. Thank you, Lucas. He's going to speak about the market power balance in processed tomato food chain. And then we are going to have to Mr. Ivan Juric. He's a research associate in agricultural markets, marketing and world agricultural trade from IMAO. Thank you, Ivan. He's going to talk about the price and uh, transmission along processes, tomato product value chain. And last but not least, of course, we're going to have the, the honor to, to be with uh, David Berlin from the University of Hertfordshire. He's going to uh, to deal with the, the round table with all the participants and all the, the, the questions of the event. So, um, well, we are very well of, of time. So our first speaker is going to be uh, Celine Kidel from the unit in wine, spirits and horticultural products from the DG Agri of the European Commission. Celine, whenever you want, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming and, and uh, for listening. Um, I am first going to introduce uh, I am the first to speak and, and, and come already with the institu institu institutional point of view. But uh, just to give you a little bit of an uh, uh, idea of what is already out there in terms of uh, policy measures uh, to enhance transparency and fairness in the food supply chain. Um, I wanted to start by reminding everyone about our mandate, because of course, at the European level, we cannot just act uh, on, uh, 
on our own volition on any uh, subject that we uh, would like to intervene, we have a mandate that has been given to us by the member states. And, and if you see the one on agriculture, which is uh, here uh, reproduced on, on the, the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, it, there are several references to, uh, I wouldn't say prices, there is actually one reasonable prices for consumers, but you know there is uh, uh, references to uh, stabilizing markets uh, in uh, ensuring a fair standard of living, Living, uh, earnings. So there are um, ideas of fairness already in introduced there and transparency is, is, uh, is sort of implied uh, to be able to stabilize markets because you need uh, transparent uh, information so that you can improve the stabilization. Now what are, are some of our instruments uh, that uh, we have already um, uh, we're already working on. Uh, we have, of course, the common organization of the market. Uh, this is uh, well established and, and well known. I will briefly mention it. We have now um, adopted the, the directive on unfair trading practices. I will also not dwell on it, but uh, remind you of, of the principles. And uh, what we are mostly doing uh, is a lot of more market monitoring so that it informs our decision and, and also that we uh, help actors on the market uh, have informed decisions. Um, and the newcomer in, the, in this picture is also that we have improved the market transparency recently um, with, with the advanced regulatory measures. Um, and, and you will hear this will have a, at least some effect on the uh, food supply chain as, it's, as it concerns uh, processed tomatoes. But I will come to that later. Now, on the common organization of the markets, you will hear later from uh, my co-panelists references to uh, POs and IBOs. Um, most of you uh, are probably familiar with, uh, with those, this jargon that we use. Um, so what we are trying to do in the common organization of the markets is, is basically to strengthen the position of the farmers because as you see on my slide where there are approximately 11 million farmers in the eu um, and what we tell them is organize together that so that you're stronger in the food supply chain because on the other side, you have a few retailers, uh, there's a lot of concentration, um, and also on the, on the processing side, there is also some concentration. So the idea is for them to organize and, and with that to make better decision. Uh, we have recently published the result of a study that we, we did on uh, producer organizations and association of producer organizations, less on interbranch organizations. And interbranch organizations, as you understand, it's uh, across the food supply chain. So it's also an interesting tool. Um, I invite you to have a look at this uh, study. I've included the link here. It's, it's interesting to see that, I mean, we, we are in food and vegetable uh, we have a long running uh, history of, of uh, producer organizations. So the 50%, more than 50% of the sector is already organized in, in some kind of cooperative or uh, um, producer organization. Not all producer organizations are actually recognized, uh, but that doesn't mean that they cannot have a, a stronger position. It, it, being recognized brings you an additional value in terms of uh, operational programs that you can submit, uh, etc. But this is uh, this is already a very interesting step uh, in terms of fairness in the food supply chain to be developed. Now, the directive on unfair trading practices is a long history. It took uh, about 10 years to come to life. Uh, it, I will not go into it into detail. A lot has been written on it already, also in the value mix uh, project. Um, but the idea of a directive, of course, is minimum harmonization. So you cannot uh, sort of uh, go um, uh, so far beyond. You're, we're just going to set a standard amongst all member states. Uh, we've uh, identified uh, 16 practices, 10 which are fully prohibited, six that are, I would say, gray, uh, prohibited unless uh, otherwise uh, agreed in advance uh, amongst the 
um, market players. And the idea is to protect the weaker against the stronger. But that doesn't mean you protect, you, you always protect the farmer against the retailer. It's basically along the food supply chain and depending on, um, on the size of the player. Um, it also foresees coordination between member states, which is interesting because we will see that later. It's also in the market transparency, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna come to that. Um, so here are, for reference to 10, what we call the black uh, unfair trading practices. You see uh, a lot is to be done uh, in terms of, uh, of fairness. Um, and, but what is now the key is that it was just adopted last year. Um, we've now, and I, I invite all our viewers, uh, we've now launched a, a survey, public survey um, for suppliers to reply. And then we, we plan to do this on a more or less annual basis um, to kind of establish a baseline of where, where, where uh, they stand. Now, member states still have until next year to transpose it into national law. And uh, if they don't, <laughs> um, it will become directly applicable only as of the end of next year. Existing contracts still need to be adapted and they have quite some time to do it. And then we will uh, evaluate it in 2025. So as you see, it will take some time before uh, we can assess the effects uh, of this um, uh, directive on the market. Now, what we do mostly here, uh, at least in my unit, is uh, we monitor uh, and we uh, make information available. So you're certainly probably uh, familiar with our agri-food data portal. We post a lot, a lot of data, a lot of information, which we gather from member states, but also from experts. Um, but there is uh, uh, limitations. Now, of course, we have uh, data available, but at the production uh, stage. So downstream, it's still very scarce. Uh, we have uh, data available on prices, but uh, not all quantities. Um, it's the member states that report uh, for the most part. So it, we are dependent on member states reporting and they themselves have operators reporting to them. So um, while we try as much we can as uh, to verify, there are several steps into the chain before the information gets to us and actually gets published. There is currently no coordination mechanism between uh, um, the member states. So we just uh, sort of uh, help them uh, exchange best, best practices, but this will have to be stepped up. And uh, as I've seen, uh, showed right before, we have the, so this, uh, this website uh, public where all the information is posted. For fresh tomatoes, um, to give you a comparison, we have on price monitoring, uh, the legal basis is the CMO, so that what I've mentioned before, the regulation uh, 1308. Um, where we've asked member states to uh, report to us so that we can continue monitoring, analyzing, managing the market, and you see ensuring market transparency. Uh, in the delegated regulation, we're very uh, detailed about what we want to get as uh, data in terms of fresh tomatoes. Uh, we get it every week on, on Wednesdays and we publish it uh, right away. Um, but the limitation there is, so we get uh, key uh, representative markets where data uh, is available. So sometimes we just don't get the data because uh, member states consider that they are not receiving data to be transmitted to us. Um, so we get three sorts, round truce is cherry, and we get it ex packaging station for the moment. Um, so you can see the representative markets here are, are there are numeral, but they're not all member states. So again, limitation of, of information. This is what we publish. So this is an example of a weekly uh, prices of uh, representative, uh, representative weekly prices of tomatoes. This is the latest one, I believe, yes, uh, week 37. It's available on our website and you can see here all the variation. I mean, this is a, an average of, uh, of all those uh, tomatoes uh, and, um, and, and, and all those varieties. Um, 
but this is at X packaging station. So we, we don't get more information than that. Um, on this, and, and I have circled at the top, on this other page, we publish monthly prices, where here you see more markets, you, you see more uh, member states reporting than the representative ones, and you can follow a little bit the, um, the, the evolution by playing, this is an, an interactive app, so you can uh, easily uh, create charts or export reports and, uh, and, and have up-to-date information. Now, we also have set up market observatories with experts. So um, the idea is to enhance transparency uh, and to uh, tackle price volatility uh, and monitor crisis. So clearly this has been very efficient, for example, uh, during the COVID crisis. We have discussed this with our economic board. So there's a, an, a board of experts. Uh, it's divided into four uh, subgroups pip fruit, citrus fruit, stone fruit, and tomatoes. Um, all the member organizations belong to the food and vegetable uh, supply chain. Uh, there are a number of experts that have been selected. That, uh, there was a call for application. They've been selected and they are members of the subgroup. And there, I, the point is for them to uh, discuss uh, and advise, uh, give us advice on economic factors, um, inform us about the market situation, uh, provide data, and, uh, and with them we also discuss issues uh, that we see in terms of price reporting. Uh, we also publish an outlook, which is something different. We, you, some of you might be familiar with our short-term and medium-term medium outlooks. We also consult the Ex economic board on this, and we've created a dedicated web page. We publish all presentations and meeting reports, so it, it is highly transparent. There is very few uh, information that is discussed in those meetings that is not then reported uh, publicly on our website. Um, and you can see here on the tomato subgroup, so our last meeting was on the 24th of June. We're going to have one again on the 9th of October. Um, and this is the, the web page where you can see the agenda, the meeting report, and the presentations. Um, and for example, the last meeting we discussed processed tomatoes with the, and, and this was a part of the information that you would find on the, on the, our website in terms of production and forecast. Now, that's the most uh, crucial one for today's um, discussion is that we have enhanced our market transparency measures recently. There were a lot of calls uh, on the commission to address the issue of lack of transparency and information asymmetry in the food supply chain. Um, repeated from the Parliament, from the Council, and generally uh, from all stakeholders. So after much discussion, we amended uh, the current market transparency regulation uh, on, in October uh, last year. And it will become applicable as of January of next year, the 1st of January. It, it puts in place an NN system of price collection along the food supply chain for representative prices in not just selling prices, but also buying prices. And this is a, a big novelty for everyone on the, in the sector. Um, it, it's not for everyone to report. Obviously, we've, we've set a threshold for member states, but what is interesting is not just for member states that are producing, but also those that are using more than 2% of the total union uh, corresponding use. So it's gonna be a lot of member states who will have to, uh, to be reporting data. Um, it will be the member states that will define their own methodology to collect data. So they are currently, this is, uh, this is being discussed and work with them. Uh, and they can delegate to operators the transmission of the information a little bit like it was already done for other price reporting. But we are going to set a coordination mechanism between member states uh, and stakeholders so that we can better uh, harmonize how and, and follow uh, how this is, this is going to be done. Now, the benefits, obviously, uh, everyone along the supply chain should see benefits. Uh, 
better risk management for uh, for producers, um, managing price volatility, increased trust. Um, I, to list a few, um, and uh, for us, uh, more informed public policy, uh, we will hopefully have a reduced need for public intervention. That's, uh, that's our hope. Uh, and uh, there will be uh, better enforcement and, and for uh, everyone else along the lines, uh, consumers, researchers, uh, and um, any stakeholder uh, uh, should have more information on where the prices stand along the food supply chain. Now for price uh, processed tomatoes, and this is where I will stop, there is a big new step because this is was the first time that you, we will ask for uh, prices. And I have listed here exactly what we hope to get. So farm gate prices. So this is not uh, X packaging station. Uh, it, it is harvested products. And for tomatoes, we should get it every year um, on at the end of January. Uh, so we are not asking yet for buying prices. I, I say yet, but I mean, I, my words are my own and not those of the commission. Um, we are only starting at farm gate prices for processed tomatoes. And uh, let's see in the coming years what this will do to the food supply chain in that sector. Voila. Thank you very much, Celine. It's always for, for us, all the members of the Volumix projects and the whole panelists to know what's the, the point of view of the European Commission. So thank you very much, Celine, again. Now it's, the, now it's going to present uh, Hilda Siguda dotir She's the marketing director of Marmarkt, and she's going to talk about the understanding food value chains. Please, Hilda, whenever you want. So um, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be with you here today. So uh, my role within the uh, Valumix project is the communication, dissemination, and stakeholder outreach for the for the project. So my main main activities are um, sharing the results of the project on our website and um, social media, reaching out to stakeholders like yourselves to share with you our results and to engage with our co-creation activities, which is very core cool, um, value of our project. So I'm just gonna quickly run through um, the scale of the project, um, the obje objectives, main activities, the methodology and sort of um, a brief overview of the food value chain versus the um, food system, our expected outcomes and the participants and our um, stakeholders that are involved in our co-creation activities. Um, so the project is a four year horizon 2020 um, project. Um, we got the EU grant of 6 million euro and we started in 2017 and we are thus um, starting our fourth project year and will be ending next May um, 2021. We are 21 partner organizations across 18 European countries, no 14 countries sorry, and we have two Asian partners, uh, one university in China and another in Vietnam. The overall objective of the Valumix project is to provide decision makers throughout food value chains with a comprehensive suite of approaches and tools that would en enable them to evaluate the impact of strategic and operational policies to enhance the resilience, integrity and sustainability of food value chains for European countries. What the project will do is to implement a holistic approach and a causality based system framework supported by new advances in theory, modeling and data gathering, which is required to capture and understand the dynam dynamics and interactions in food systems in Europe. Um, Valumix will provide improved understanding and models underpinning policy recommendations and an enabling advice aimed at decision makers with key roles and required capacity 
to enhance the resilience with respect to sustainability of strategic food value chains in Europe. The main activities is structured through um, several phases of work. So we've uh, com completed phase one, um, two and three. We are still um, finishing obviously the integrated quantitative model leading to future studies. That is our scenario work, which is being implemented as we speak, which will be used for policy and use. And we are testing fit for purpose scenarios. We are in our um, activities studying five different core um, food value chains and using them as case studies for our research. We're looking into salmon to salmon fillers as a whole um, value chain case, beef to steak, dairy, milk, wheat to bread, and not um, and least and the tomato to canned tomato, which we are um, looking into results from the Valimix project today. This is a brief overview of the work and the different work packages that are carrying out the research um, and the phases that we are involved with. The overall approach and methodology, as I spoke about before, we have a suite of tools and different approaches combined in gaining a very wide um, knowledge of the food systems. Um, for the Valimix project, the system dynamic framework will be applied as a methodolog methodological approach and will be implemented as a key driver of the project work throughout. And the joint workshops with all the um, researchers involved and stakeholders. So the food value chains is comprised of the stages of the path of the food products, products, starting with inputs, primary production, manufacturing, logistics and transportation, grocery and retail sectors, until consumers and even waste. Food systems, however, comprise the food value chains and networks in addition to waste management and all the supporting and integrating, integrating activities. Valumix will improve knowledge and food chains and their underlying drivers, deliver a comprehensive assessment of all dimensions of the sustainability, performance and resilience of food chains and the contribution to jobs and growth both territorially and at EU level, improve capacity to model the sustainability and resilience of food chains, enhance capacity to assess the functioning of value chains upstream and downstream chain flows and price transmissions along the chain. We will get some results on that later um, during this webinar. Um, Valumix will also increase capacity to map the occurrence of unfair um, practices in food chain and develop approaches to assess their impact, clarify the development of added value and profit margins in food value chains and how these are distributed at each level. Increase understanding of how con consumers' demand and consumption patterns affect the organization of food chains and vice versa, and the sustainability and resilience. We recently had a very interesting webinar on some of our consumer work. I encourage you to um, follow our news on that on the, on the website. Improve the capacity of relevant policies and food chain stakeholders to improve food chain sustainability and resilience. These are our partners. We have universities, SMEs, um, research organization, industry association, and a retailer, Reve from Austria, um, Austria. These are some of our stakeholders that have helped us in our co-creation activities. And we would very much like more to join our platform to get news and um, updated invites to webinars like these to help us really get a really wide understanding and build the big picture with us in Valumix. Thank you very much. We can see the link here to join um, for the newsletter and to become a stakeholder. And please also follow us on social media. Thank you very much. That will be the end of my um, presentation. Thank you, Hilda. It's been a pleasure that you've been uh, sharing with us uh, a very global 
overview of the project that is very useful for all of us, of course. Great. I'm going to launch a polling now just to have it open for everybody that are attending to the uh, webinar. So I'm just going to launch it and feel free to answer it and then we'll look at the results during the Q&A. Okay. So I hope everyone can see and put their votes in. This will be open during the duration of the webinar. And now is um, now we are going to have to Antonella Samoggia from the University of Bologna in Italy. She's going to present the Italian process tomato food chain governance. Antonella, whenever you want, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Eduardo. Uh, just let me know if you see my screen and the presentation. Everything is fine. Yes, it's okay. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, so thank you for coming and joining us during this uh, webinar. Um, as mentioned, we will be presenting uh, some preliminary results we are developing in the Volumix project. Um, I've been a case study leader for the process tomato chain. Uh, and today I uh, will specifically focus on the governance aspects of the Italian process tomato chain. Um, and then uh, let's say that this can be um, a preliminary result in order to uh, better understand uh, some of the results that will be then presented by Ivan and Lukas uh, following my presentation. So I would like to provide some uh, um, overall data uh, regarding uh, the processed tomato market and um, with a view of the global market and the European uh, dimension of within this market. So the top producers at, Europe, at, at the world level uh, in terms of processed tomato uh, is uh, the USA as a whole country, where we see we have uh, about 27% of the overall global production is carried out within the USA. Then we have 13% in Italy, 12% in China and 9% in Spain. So I would say uh, we can say that the European market um, and the European farmers do play a key role in this uh, uh, specific chain. Uh, if we focus uh, within the European um, market, Italy uh, and Spain uh, are the key actors. Italy basically produces about 50% of uh, the processed tomato, so I'm still talking about the raw material, and about one third is produced in Spain. So I would say that this webinar does represent really well uh, the overall European market in terms of processed tomato. Uh, this is a, provides a, an overview of how uh, was the trend in terms of uh, processing production. Uh, so the tomato for processing production, uh, as we were saying, California in particular, uh, and that's why uh, there's a big difference between the data that I presented earlier in the USA as this data specifically represent California only. And then we have uh, Italy is the second key player and China and Spain again. Uh, and as you see, uh, over the years, there have been some uh, um, let's say some leading roles of the countries that they do play uh, a bit the leadership in the four in the in the three of us I would say Italy, China, and Spain. The annual turnover for Italy in particular is about three billion euro. So this is the value of the overall production um, for Italy. There is a difference between the different. Uh, types of tomato, processed tomato, the tomato paste and canned tomato. Um, Italy is the leader for the canned tomato uh, with the 1.4 tons, million tons, uh, whereas China is the key leader for the tomato paste. Um, well, the European and the US, they do have a bit different uh, regulations as what can be defined as paste and uh, can tomato, we can, we can say that can tomato is basically the diced, the cut uh, tomato. 
So it's the one where whenever we open a can, we actually see the, the piece of tomato. So uh, Italy, in terms of canned tomato, it produces about 78% of the overall uh, tomato global. These are the key companies for the tomato processing um, in Italy. Uh, as you see, uh, you may not be aware of all these companies. Uh, let's say that the most uh, uh, European or present in foreign markets is Muti. Uh, there are others. Uh, these, are, these are the names of the companies, not necessarily of the brands that they use for selling. So uh, this is just to provide an overall view. Princess, for example, is very common in the UK market. Where is the tomato produced? Well, the actors of tomato, um, we can say that this year, so in 2020, around 37,000 hectares of tomato for processing has been produced in the north of Italy. Uh, so i uh, provide you the map with this. Uh, and within this area, about 70% is in Emilia-Romagna. This year, then we have Lombardy, Piedmont, and, and Veneto. So this is about 50% of the overall Italian produ production. Uh, the other 50%, around 50%, is produced in the south of Italy. So the north of Italy produces basically 2.5 uh, million tons of uh, the processed tomato overall at national level. So that's 50%. So what is the governance of this uh, chain? Well, in 2006 and seven, that there has been a consultation within the actors within this district in the north of Italy. And in the 2011, the IBO has been recognized by the regional government and by the uh, EU uh, in 2012. How is the IBO structured on how is the overall governance of this area? Well, we have single companies and cooperatives, and we, we can call it level one. Then we have level two, and these are POs, as Celine was explaining, these are key actors in the chain, in all the chains, and in particular in the fruit and vegetable chains. Uh, within the specific case, uh, the, the PO are mostly in, char uh, in charge of the negotiation, the bargaining, the programming of the processors. The, so they do create, play a role in the relation within the other actors in the chain. Um, they control the disciplinary of production. There is an underlying uh, system of mutualism, of uh, mutual support within the PO. So they do play a key role to the sustainability of the system. Then we have the IBO. The IBO uh, is one of the five IBOs in Italy. Uh, briefly remind that currently in the EU there are 133 IBOs. In, the, in Italy there are five IBOs. Two of these IBOs are the processed tomato, so we have an IBO in, in the north of Italy and another IBO in the south of Italy. Uh, about 2,000 producers belong to the IBO. Uh, these uh, are uh, also organized in POs and so producer organizations, 13 producer organizations, 20 processors. So this is the most, let's say, the manufacturers, so the industry in this area. Within the IBO, there are also the professional organizations represented. Um, they promote the integration process within the overall industry, so the farmers and the processors. And they do not intervene in, the, in trade negotiations, but I will go more in detail than this. Um, so the tomato process is, is carried out by private companies for 66% and by producers cooperatives by 34%. So there are producer cooperatives that also are in charge of the processing. Um, as I was saying, about 50% in the north and 50% in the south, more or less. This is the material flow representation. Uh, what we have, it's mostly um, using the IBO, uh, the local raw material. Then there is the processing. Uh, then it, it's then turned into, let's say, uh, as um, main pr products in puree, canned and paste. There are also byproducts that are produced. And the channels that are then um, the main uh, buyers for the processed tomato are the ones mentioned on the left, on the right, sorry, the Orca, the retail and the food industry. In what 
uh, share? Well, we see in the pie share there is on the right uh, bottom uh, about 51.3% um, is sold to the food industry, about 30% is sold to the retailers, and about 18% to the Oreca, so the hotel, restaurants, and cafe. This share of the Oreca has been increasing in the last years. Uh, clearly now this current year has been a very specific year, so we will see uh, what are, will be the data for the 2020. But th that's the trend. Um, so the commercial relationship within the IBO is carried out through a framework contract. So uh, the framework co contract sets uh, the main rules in the contract by contract uh, relationships, but then these are carried out uh, on a, a bilateral basis. So it's just providing an overall framework contract. Uh, the trading between uh, the members of the IBO so are based on a premium and a penalty on the price uh, paid, and that's defined within uh, the framework contract. But then the details of this premium and penalty are negotiated within the single, within the single contracts. Producers and processors. So um, I, will, I will give you two focuses. One is on, on the producers processors relation. The other one is on the processors retailers. So the producer processors. Well, in this case, we have a reference price. This reference price is negotiated at the beginning of the year, usually is negotiated within February of each year. You see uh, when uh, I reported here also the, the dates, the exact dates of the negotiations. We have the 2017 and 18, it was around 80 euro per tonne. In 19, it was 86, and in 2020, in 87. Euro per tons. So there has been an increase. Uh, let's say that 2017 and 18, there have been difficult years for the negotiations. And that's the reason why we see then for the 2019, uh, the final agreement was reached only in May, which was definitely late, as we will see, because of the timeline of the overall chain relations. Um, uh, probably most of you are aware of the importance of the BRICS value. Uh, let's say that 2020, uh, they have set this price for a fairly low BRICS value, which means that if the farmers manage to provide raw material with a higher BRICS value, then they will get a higher uh, amount of money per tons. Mm -hmm. So this is in the sense, is the premium price I was mentioning earlier. Um, this step of the chain is, is crucial and it is carried out within the IBO uh, because it sets the amount of actors produced by the farmers and it is a, a constant negotiation between the farmers and the processors because clearly according to the uh, demand curve if the processors end up the following year having still having quite a wide uh, high amount of uh, uh, of products that have not that has not been sold, they will not be so happy. I would say to pay a high price on the following year for the raw material. So basically, what the negotiation is aimed at is at keeping a good equilibrium, thus a fairly sustainable uh, relationship be between the farmers and the processors. And this is also thanks to a fairly uh, good collaboration and trust within the chain. These are companies that are based in the in the territory for the last 40 years, so uh, they know each other well and they want to keep uh, the, the relationship going. What happens between the processors and the retailers? Well, the retailers clearly they have different management negotiations. Uh, some of them are very strongly price driven. Some others are more quality driven. This it's, uh, it, it's just normal as any other um, agro-industrial company, I would say. Uh, but let's say that the way this uh, price, this strategy is achieved or is implemented might be, um, might create problems along the chain, I would say. So uh, one of the most uh, updated information that I think is important to keep in mind is the existence or uh, uh, it is slowly diminishing, but the existence of uh, online double auctions. These auctions are usually held once or twice a year. 
uh, there are two rounds. In the first round, the retailer will ask for a first price to the tomato processors and that the tomato processors will provide this price. And then there is a second round and the retailer starts the second round starting from the price set during the first round, but the processors that win the contract are the ones that offer the lowest price compared to the price set in the first round. This means that clearly uh, what the processors get is a fairly low, it's a low price for, for their product. And this impacts clearly the chain uh, upstream, so the farmer's sustainability, presumably for the following year. So currently the Italian parliament, the chamber of deputies on the June 19 approved a law uh, to stop this managerial practice. Currently is under discussion in the Senate. It was approved by the committee, the Cultural Commission Committee uh, of the Senate in July 2020, on the 1st of July, uh, with, uh, uh, let's say, the awareness that of the existence uh, of the approval of the UTP directive uh, that was uh, published in, in April 19. So now, uh, say, they go in the same direction. So they go in the direction of respecting the farmers, but then again, they have to be aligned. So, uh, but I would say uh, clearly the COVID situation stopped or slowed down the situation, but that's the direction that the Italian government is taking. Um, briefly, uh, this is the timing, as I was saying, the neg press negotiations and together with the production planning ends in February or should end in February. Then the, there is a planting part. Uh, in the last years, um, farmers plant uh, the, the plants, the small plants. So in one hectare, the, the farmers will plant around 30,000 uh, plants of, of the plants that are made for the processed tomato. And there's also a relation with agreement of, with the packaging industry, uh, which then follows uh, for the last, for the summer months, the tomato harvesting as such. So uh, as you see, every part, every month of the year, it is crucial uh, to ensure the sustainability of their overall uh, food chain. And farmers and the retailers, despite we see that they are far away from each other, they do play a key role in determining this relationship. So there is the importance of the coordination, the seeds, clearly the seeds and the nursery of the seeds plus uh, the planting is to be negotiated within the POs of the IBO, so the producer organization. Uh, I would like to just provide a focus on the importance of the relationship between the regional packaging and the mechanical engineer within the regional uh, region of Emilia Romagna. Uh, the regional package, packaging industry is another key sector in the, uh, in the e economy of the region. Uh, just one final word, I would like to thank the regional government, uh, the Territorial Development Agency, Arthur. Uh, they did contribute uh, substantially to the, uh, to the results and the coordination of this activity. So thank you very much, uh, and I'm open for all the questions. Thank you, Antonella. It's been very interesting to know your, your approach from the point of view of the Italian industry of tomato, of tomato industry. Thank you very much. Now um, it's going to be the, the, the next presentation that is going to be carried out by Rosa de la Torre from CETAEX, it's an agri-food technological center of Extremadura in Spain. She's going to, to share with us the Spanish Processed Tomato Food Chain Overview. Rosa, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Eduardo, and thank you to the organization of this European project, uh, because CETAEX is out of the project, but I would like uh, all my presentation uh, will help you to increase the knowledge and to develop uh, the, the project. Um, as Antonella said previously, the, the production song of uh, tomato um, for industrial um, 
is uh, basically in the north hemisphere uh, and in the south is the less part of the production. Um, you, you know that there are countries um, that produce a lot like California and USA, Italy, China, Spain, that Antonella explained very well this data previously. Um, the analysis of the world market for industrial tomato from the uh, last year is that uh, these are the principal countries that importing uh, tomato from uh, the whole countries. Mm -hmm. Germany is the, the most important uh, buyer of tomato from all the countries and also the states, uh, the, the states um, buy some products from other countries apart from their own production. Uh, from Spain, uh, we export uh, several countries, um, basically up the same that the uh, slide before, uh, and the, the market of Spain in tomato process is uh, very high, as you say. Um, how is the tomato sector in Extremadura? Why Extremadura? Uh, if you see the map, uh, the tomato factory in Spain are concentrated in the southwest of Spain. Um, there are another factories around the, the country, but um, are spotted in, in the map. Mm -hmm. The tomato production in Spain is around the most principal rivers basically in the um, river basin, like uh, Ebro River in the north, Tajo and Guadiana rivers in the southwest, and Guadalquivir River in the south. This makes the total production of Spain, of Spain uh, last year, um, this quantity of tomato tons. The uh, Guadiana River basins, where Petais is located, uh, have a lot of reservoir and irrigation channel and irrigation zone that could um, possible uh, a lot of uh, farms and a lot of uh, crops of tomato. In this area, uh, we produce the approximately 70% of Spanish production. We have 20 producer organization, 14, 14 producing industries for tomato paste, powder, size, dyes, sauces, etc. Uh, five uh, sauce making industries, three industries that make tomato powder, a lot of employment, employment and 1,140 farmers around. Uh, this um, is uh, all complete in a network of tomato producer cooperatives in our region. For this reason, Extremadura in the southwest of Spain is an opportunity because we have land, we have soil, we have water, and also we have talent. Um, and uh, the tomato campaigns in advance for this year is a little um, less than the year before. We have a very hard um, summer and, uh, and a strong uh, weather condition that makes this uh, this production will be less than the year before. The evolution of the yield of the tomato production in Extremadura is increasing year by year. Mm -hmm. And uh, is an important uh, crop for our region. Uh, CETAES is, in, uh, is um, implied in the tomato value chain and in the quality control because um, in our region, the irrigation wa water quality is uh, directed by um, the network Recarex, 
is a irrigation network to to help the the farmer for um, the irrigation. The red access bay is uh, a network of technical group focused on plant health and uh, referring to fertilizers, Red Affairs is an advisory network for farmers. Um, the pro integrated production uh, constitutes the most suitable way of growing for focus on soil, crop, and sustainability. And uh, at the end, the raw material, the pesticide residue, residue heavy metal, nitrates and nitrates, and the total quality is uh, focused on the associa association Mesa de Tomate. Uh, this association joined the producer uh, groups, eh, OPFH, and the tomato companies. And, uh, have the help of CETAIS. Um, the Association of Mesa del Tomate is the in charge of supervision of contract and CETAIS is in charge of training and supervision of the quality control. The quality control uh, in the entrance of the factory um, is very important because the raw material arrive uh, to the industry and uh, in this point is where it is decided whether the tomato is suitable or not. The guys uh, um, train to the operator of the Asociación Mesa del Tomate in the two most important parameters to go into the factory, breeze degree and pH. As Antonella said, breeze is um, very important for the factory is the total soluble solids uh, that the tomato have and the pH because it's very important. The uh, Mesa de Tomate and ZX, ZX elaborate uh, a document to, um, to, um, to, to share and to look the most important um, acceptable tomatoes to go into the factory. Um, CETAIS is in the core of the tomato production area for this uh, because um, it's an R&D center with all the agro-food in infrastructures uh, all, uh, all together. Join the experimental kitchen, a very big pilot plan, several laboratories and experimental farm. This experimental farm um, have different crops depending on the project that we are developed in this moment. Uh, to help the tomato production to know the quality of the raw material, CETAES have different ways. First, uh, the sample preparation is in the pilot plan of the raw material by stabilization of the tomato juice for analysis. This is a, a patented methodology. And second, the analytical determination. The most important analytical determination for the factories are both with consistency, this degree, pH, and color. And color is an objective measure in, in the space. Uh, we help also to tomato companies to relax the production. For this reason, uh, CITA is every day. Uh, during the week takes the sample for factories and develop PCR analysis focus on microbiological contamination looking for different mi microorganisms. The results are issued to the companies in four hours. Hmm? To increase the tomato value chain, uh, uh, we know that R&D are a strategic point for the tomato industry. In the first transformation uh, process to tomato crush, tomato paste, tomato rice, the whole big tomato, and tomato powder. And in the second transformation, different sources of ready mix based on tomato. For this reason, the tomato industry, industries know they have to innovate and are involved in several national and international projects. 
and uh, the new challenge for tomato processing industry are based on search for new tomato variety, optimization of processing, adaptation to new consumer taste and habits, new technologies in the production, identification and management of the environment impact, optimize the use of agrochemical and other impacts in the cultivation of industrial tomato, the use of genetic research as key for food safety and security, harnessing the value of tomato genetic resource for now and the future, and the use of byproducts in food and cosmetic products. Uh, these uh, are in several projects developed by CETAI with the tomato company. Mm -hmm. Also, CETAI, CETAI X plus tomato industry attend the World Processing Tomato Co Congress and organize the first technological tomato Congress in Spain. Uh, CETA X uh, managing the Technological Observatory for Industrial Tomato to disseminate among the agents of the semi processed tomato sector the potential benefits and to maintain technological cooperation through the creation of a permanent technology platform. According to the Ministry of Agriculture of Spain, the ways of make marketing the fresh tomato directly can be this, for simple to complex, directly from farmer by different uh, ways mm, to traditional shop or to the supermarket. And also the fresh tomato can also be marketed uh, through a process transformation. 20% by farmers and 80% by cooperative are processed uh, and is export 80% the whole world and in national market and 20%. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I open to any question. Please look at uh, Chikura from the Czech University of Life Sciences in Prague. He's going to speak about market power balance in processed tomato food chain. Please, Lucas, whenever you want. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so I hope you can see my screen and my presentation. Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you. So uh, good morning. And first of all, I'd like to say that it's my pleasure that uh, I can present here the joint study or the basic results of the joint study that we did together with my co-authors, Tino Shemale Yagdani and Antonio Simogia. And we dealt in this study with market power balance in processed tomato food chain. So the content is quite standard. I start with motivation and aims, then I with basic stuff regarding uh, the measure that we use for uh, market uh, power or maybe market imperfections in, in the food chain. And uh, yeah, then I mainly focus on the results and uh, provide some concluding remarks. So first of all, motivation. So we can say that in the last two decades, the retail and processing segments of food supply chain have experienced increasing concentration across a global level. So this implies that the uh, bargaining power space dramatically increase. If it is the case, if the processors abuse the market power or not. So this is the question. So we are interested in this study in the market imperfection in the input as well as output tomato processing market. In the overall volume X project, we also dealt with uh, other food value chain. But today I'd like to speak about the tomato. So the basic principles. So I presented here for markdown pricing, that is for input market. As we think about the food processor and the input market for the food processor. So the basic theory tells us that if uh, the processor follows the principle of profit maximization, so it should pay the farmers uh, the price for the raw material, the, which is equal to the uh, marginal revenue product. 
which is in, in, in fact the, uh, the price that he gets for the last uh, sold, uh, sold, sold unit. If it deviates from this uh, equality, so it means that there are some market imperfections. It can be a result of implied strategies, say transaction cost, market growth, capacities, entry barriers, so whatever. Everything can be translated as a, a market power, so some sign of the market power. So in this case, you we can just uh, simply see it in the figure. So this is a situation when the price for the material is equal to the marginal revenue product. This is a perfect competition. So this is say our ideal case that the farmer get the price from the processor of, of this level. But if the processor abuse some market power, say market power that we will call it. So it pay, uh, so the processor pays lower price for the raw material as compared to the perfect competition, which can be say in our case, idle, uh, uh, idle situation. The same can be introduced for output uh, market. So it, it's in fact the inverse of this picture and we can talk about the price of the processed uh, uh, tomato with respect to the marginal cost. So in fact, we can talk about these inequalities. So for markdown, that is input market, so it can be this inequality and for output market, it can be this inequality. So ideal market is that there is equality. If processor abuse some market power on input market, there will be this inequality and we will measure it by relative uh, index that we will call learner index and we express it in a relative measure. So zero in this case will be no abuse of market power, no market imperfections. Yes. And then if we go to one, so then we can say that there are like more and more pronounced market imperfections. And in, in fact, if learner index equals to one, so we can uh, interpret it like monopson. And for output market, we can interpret it like monopole or monopole market power. So this is the basic uh, uh, a theoretical principle and how we can just uh, translate our results and how we can just interpret our, our results in, in fact. The data, I don't, I don't want to talk uh, about uh, the uh, estimation proce procedure. So we have, we, if some, somebody is interested, I can answer it later but uh, we have some model for markdown, some model for markup, these are the variables. And most importantly, we use Amadeus data. The Amadeus data that covers the period 2006 to 2018, and it, uh, it's done for Italian food processor uh, producers industry. So in uh, this case, we cover just uh, the processors that uh, uh, that uh, have the data in Amadeus database and we uh, just deal only with Italy. Results. First, I'd like to start with input market. So we talk about markdown and learner index for input market. In this case, we can see that the learner index equals on the average 0 0.17. It means that the farmer in this case get on average 70% less as compared to the situation uh, when we have perfect competition. So if you take the price from the perfect competition, so in this case, on average, uh, the farmer gets 17% less on average over the overall period, we can see the distribution. So mainly 
and the distribution. Uh, if we take the majority of cases, say two thirds of the samples, so uh, the learner index is equal. Um, and if I take standard deviation, so between 0 0.11 till 0 0.23. So we can conclude that we can observe quite considerable degree of market imperfection, but not so high, not so high for uh, the majority of components, but still considerable degree of market imperfections. But this is interesting. When we just look on the figure, how the learner index de developed over the time, we can see that there was a significant drop in the year 2010. So it means that the market power imbalances have considerably changed in favor of farmers. So in fact, they get a higher price for their products from 2010. Um, it went up a little bit after that, but still uh, it didn't get on the level that we could observe bef uh, before 2010. If we just look on the output market, and if we talk about the learner index for output market, so that we calculate from markup uh, model, we can see that the learner index is significantly lower as compared to the input market. So the uh, market imperfections on the output market are not so pronounced as compared to the input market. And we can also see that the distribution is skewed to lower values in this case. And again, the development is very interesting. So you can see that before 2010, the market imperfections were quite low, very low as compared uh, to the situation after 2010. And if you just imagine the figure that we had for mark down model or input market, so we can see that there uh, were some, uh, that the situation compensated a little bit. So there were some shifts in the, uh, market imperfection along the food value chain. So we can say, or we can conclude that these market imper imperfections didn't decrease in the study period in the, in the tomato food value chain, but only reallocated within the chain, which is very interesting finding uh, in, in this case. If we just present the learning indexes for according to the sizes of the food processors, we can see that for output market, we observe something that we could expect that with a higher size, that is if the company is larger, so then it has uh, much more space to abyss the market power, and it shows, the figures show that in effect, the market, market imperfection increase are increasing with uh, the size of the company. Uh, this is not the case for markdown model. We can see that uh, the similar figures we can get for medium, large and large companies, but for small companies, there are some uh, some exceptions and the learner index is a little bit higher. So to summarize, we can observe that uh, the degree, some degree of non-competitive non behavior on both input as well as output market, but for input processing market, these market imperfections are more pronounced. Then we can also say that a small number of companies are characterized by considerable high degree of competitive behavior, but the learner indexes are relatively narrow and slightly skewed to, to, uh, to smaller values. And this is especially hold uh, for output market. Then we could also, uh, observed some reallocation of the market imperfections 
uh, through the food supply chain. Yeah. So uh, in this case, for input market, the learner index went down, and for output market, the learner index went up. And at the end, we can say that the positive association, which is expected, theoretically expected, uh, was only observed for output market, like positive association between the degree of market imperfection and the size of the company. So that was, or that were the main findings in our study. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'm uh, looking forward for your questions. Thank you, Lucas. It's been very interesting, your approach of the market of the tomato chain value. And now we are going to have the presentation of uh, Ivan Durich. Uh, he's a research associate um, from the Agricultural Markets, Marketing and World Agricultural Trade from IMO. He's going to speak about the price transmission along processed tomato uh, products value chain. Ivan, please, it's your yes, turn. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Um, full screen? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. So. I am Ivan Juric, senior researcher from IAMO, and together with my colleague Miranda Svanidze, uh, we did this analysis, uh, where basically there was a slight change in the title from price transmission to price formation along processed tomato product value chain in Italy. And during the presentation, I will actually say why, why is it so? So I need to say as well that the, this uh, analysis greatly relies on the results obtained from the governance study done by Antonella Simoja and her team as well with the other colleagues from the Valomix project. So as it's already shown, this analysis is done through the, under the Valomix project, which is EU Horizon 2020 project. Special focus is uh, given to the North Italy uh, supply chain because we have the access to, the, to data. And uh, as Antonella already mentioned, the interbranch organization play an important role for market stabilization and organization. Uh, which is very important for setting the framework contract rules uh, between producers and and the processors for uh, setting this reference price, which is a starting point for some detailed price settings and volumes. So just refresh her on, on her presentation. So if we look uh, on the left hand side, we can see the development of um, this reference price from 2011, 2019. So, uh, as it's mentioned already, this negotiation start in October, like after the harvesting period, they start in October, should finish uh, end of January. But as Antonella mentioned, sometimes it happens that it goes a bit further, which has an effect on, on uh, the whole market as well. Uh, but nevertheless, this reference price, as mentioned, is only a reference. And there are certain adjustments made to this price to come to the total final price uh, to producers, which might vary from contract to, to contract. If we look here, this is the, the global kind of reference price made as an average for different markets. And you can see that the blue one uh, refers to the EU5 uh, countries, where mainly Italy, uh, Spain, and Portugal are uh, there, the biggest players. Uh, what is interesting as well to see is the, the green line, which refers to uh, the price is set in California and usually is kind of trendsetter what will happen on the other other markets uh, as well. Here we can see some average prices uh, for field gate prices in US metric ton, uh, where basically you can see that uh, the prices in Europe are a bit higher compared to uh, US and uh, China and within the EU countries, the prices in North Italy uh, are a bit higher compared to Portugal and Spain, but this also has to do with the quality of the products which are not mentioned in this, uh, in this graph. If we go further um, and we look what is then the percentage share of the, this farm gate price in, the, in this first kind of reference price set, we can see that uh, up to 2017, it was on average that the producers receive about 11% uh, um, less than what was the agreed starting price, so to say. 
but then we see some changes after 2017, actually 2018, when these differences are not more than about 4%. And this might have a, uh, this might be in the connection with the new three-year framework contract set in 2018 for 2020 with certain bonuses and penalties according to the quality of uh, production. Uh, if we look uh, how much the producers in North Italy receive compared to the average on the world market, then we see that it's about 11% uh, uh, higher, which again might uh, might have to do with the quality of the uh, pro uh, of the products and the brick value. So if we go further uh, about the chain, then we come to processors, and here on the left hand side you can see especially on the left Essex, you can see the prices of tomato puree and tomato pulp. And on the red hand side, you can follow the price development for double concentrate and triple concentrate, where basically what Antonella said, there are different lines of um, distribution channels where, where this product goes for the industry, the tomato paste is most important for retail tomato puree and for Horeca channels, uh, tomato pulp. So what uh, what happens here is that um, how these prices are set for the processor level, as Antonella mentioned, there are certain auctions still before, at least before 2020, where uh, the retailers come up with certain price and then processor need to put uh, kind of offers. Yeah, so then you have this kind of opening price and then on the on this negotiation depends what would be the end price for uh, processed, processed products. If we look at the percentage share of uh, processed tomato in the in the special products like pulp, double concentrate, triple concentrate, you can see that with the level of uh, processing this uh, share decreases. The biggest one is for pulp about 20, 21%. Uh, um, this is the study done by Anika, it's a national association of processors in uh, North Italy, a very interesting study where they, they looked at the, what would be the processing cost at each level um, for each product basically. And you can see here that for the raw materials uh, on average, they calculate about 27%, which accounts basically for the price of, uh, of processed tomato. And uh, according to their calculations for the average of 2014, 2016, uh, their calculation is that 0 0.2 euro uh, per 500 grams for tomato pulp. And if you remember the prices from the previous graph uh, for tomato pulp, the processing price are about uh, 0 0.2324. So we can see here that it's very low margin, uh, margin business, so to say. Here we can see that um, the export prices for uh, uh, tomato paste in Italy, Spain, and Portugal, as they're one of the biggest exporters, especially for Europe. And uh, depending on the dry matter content, uh, when the dry matter is uh, low, then uh, I mean between 12 and 30%, then we have that uh, Spain has the lowest prices compared to Portugal and Italy, at least for the last year period. And if the dry matter content is more than 30%, then Italy has uh, much higher prices compared to Spain and, and uh, Portugal. Uh, then we come to the retail level of the chain. Basically here on the left hand side, you can see the retail price of tomato puree. And basically what we heard in the last couple of presentations, you can, uh, you can easily see here when the interbranch organizations were formed and recognized, you have a significant jump in the retail uh, prices, which actually uh, account for the increase in production cost and as well the, let's say, kind of fairer prices uh, for producers and processors. And uh, these retail prices are basically negotiated uh, in June, just before the harvesting uh, and processing uh, period. And what is also interesting to look at is the price margin between producers and uh, processors and then between processors and retailers where you can see that this price margin for processors and retailers is three, uh, three times higher compared to producers and uh, processors. So here we refer to the wholesale 
price, but not to be confused. So this price is reported uh, the wholesale market in special place uh, where they negotiate, but actually the wholesalers could be as well processors who sometimes act as wholesalers or not. And uh, here you can see that basically there is a slight difference in percentage share of the uh, producer price and wholesale price or basically processor price and uh, compared to the uh, wholesale price or processor price in retail price. So why I, there was a change in the title, as I mentioned before, is uh, mainly due to the fact that you can see that most of the prices are set on the annual level and the variation in prices, except here what you see for retail, uh, basically does not exist for many months. And to do the proper price transmission analysis, you would need, first of all, the data set, which, is, uh, which accounts for long data series. So data accessibility is uh, one of the issues. And then the variability in these prices during the, during the year. That's the main reason why, why basically, you know, do the proper price transmission analysis by using uh, uh, accepted uh, theories and methodologies. But this kind of uh, analysis of price developments and price formation along the value chain uh, nicely indicates basically what happens due to the governance structure and IBOs in, uh, in Italy. So I will not take much more time because we are already uh, over. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivan. It's been very interesting, your presentation, of course, as all of them ha has been. And um, thank you for your, your, your dedication of the, to the project. And uh, now um, we are going to have uh, the last uh, part of this event with a round table with all the participants. And it's going to be deal by David Bolin. David, please, it's your turn. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got a set of questions that have come through just now of the last uh, presentations. So I'll address these to different members of the panel. So the first question is a more general question and it's on the question which is from Greta Bogerson is more transparent price information sharing and openness seen as a key to combat unfair trading practices? So that's a more general question. Perhaps Celine, if you're still with us, you could uh, address that. So the question is, is more transparent price information sharing and openness seen as key to combat unfair trading practices? At first, I, I would say uh, any uh, transparency uh, is uh, necessary for, for more fairness, but I don't think one is necessarily linked with the other, at least not how we've designed uh, the, the, the unfair trading practice directive. Um, it's really a, a matter of, of re, uh, reorganizing the bargaining power. So it's, it's, a, it's an other aspect, I would say. So making prices, uh, information on prices more transparent is a, a, an aspect uh, of uh, fairness along the food supply chain, but then there are other practices uh, that uh, we, try, we tackle in the directive, not necessarily, uh, and, and that's why also, uh, uh, transparency on prices is not included in in the directive so one is not necessarily uh, um, linked or key to the other but they are obviously complementary thank you very voilà. much That's excellent um so another question we've had uh antonella i'll address this one to you and it's a, a general question on the market in europe for tomatoes um asking the question that do we need or does the EU not need to import tomatoes given the large market shares that we have from Italy and Spain? Well, thank you for uh, the question, um, David. Um, let's say that uh, for sure the whole idea of, uh, of the IBOs and of the market 
is to use as much as possible uh, the raw material that comes and is produced uh, within the EU territory. That's also due to the fact uh, that also, again, according to the contract, frame of contract, uh, there has to be only a few hours, between five and 12 hours, in between the harvesting and when the processors get the, the tomato to be processed. Uh, one of the latest uh, from Mutti is that um, they are inventing is a pilot project to use, uh, so Mutti is one of the leading uh, companies in Italy, um, to actually uh, can the tomato on the field. So they have, they're uh, testing these new systems. Uh, also because, uh, let's say, they, they, well, let's say 90, between 90 and 100% of the harvesting is done mechanically. There's no more the labor on the field. It's actually carried out by machines. So the idea is for sure to uh, to use the, the, the tomato on uh, you know produced here. Then again, for some specific uh, uh, products for tomato processed tomato, such as the paste and the concentrate, uh, the double, the triple. Uh, there is even the sixth the double uh, concentrate of tomato. Um, then, you know, some companies may use uh, tomato that comes from other areas. So if the question is, should they, uh, or whether we need it for some specific process tomato, yes, we need it, but the, the tendency, the trend is not to use it. All right, thank you very much. And while I've got you online, Antonella, another question, perhaps you could be the first one to address this, because it relates to what you're talking about with mechanization in the field, I think. There are a couple of questions which have come up where they've touched on the question about avoiding waste, particularly of tomatoes which are ed edible, but may be refused in terms of their quality. So I just wondered, um, the questions really are asking how much goes to waste from the tomatoes that are produced? Mm -hmm. And also the second question is, um, is really about uh, what ways are taken to avoid any such waste. Um, well, the, the, the wasting of the processed tomato, uh, again, it, it is carried out, the harvesting is carried out with mechanics and then the, uh, the a first selection of the waste product is carried out manually. So you would have somebody on the machine, on the field sometimes actually selecting some of these uh, tomatoes. Um, I should check more recent data, to be honest. Uh, we can say that at the EU level, uh, there is still some quite substantial waste. We are around 3 million tons of uh, waste. Then again, it is also true, there is an increasing number of companies, uh, very innovative, they are trying to use uh, and create byproducts. So the waste is not on the field only, but it might come also uh, at the processing stage. So the processors, what the processors do is to use uh, the powders or they use the seeds. You may create uh, uh, oil coming from the seeds of the tomato. Mm. Uh, you may also use it for, to extract lycopene. So the lycopene then is used in other uh, industries. Um, there are even companies that are using the, the red color uh, for, uh, uh, to create paints. Um, uh, so there is an increasing interest and in investments uh, to diminish this waste. Thank you, that's a very comprehensive answer and uh, shows how uh, food byproducts can go into industrial processes um, in very innovative ways. Just going, looking at our polls very quickly, I can see that um, the people in the conference believe that retailers, 74% receive the highest share of the uh, value of the chain. And also that um, the farmers conversely should receive the highest share, 81%. And um, that really public policies are a key element in uh, increasing sustainable practices. 
If I just go to um, both Ivan and Lucas, on those first two polls, how would you say your findings match against the reality answer about retailers getting greater share and the um, normative answer, which is that the farmers should? What did your studies tell you in terms of that, in terms of price transmission and market power? So even if I go to you first and then Lukash next. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this question. So what the analysis show in our case um, and what becomes visible from the structure of the governance and the IBOs, setting of IBOs, is that it seems that uh, the, what the share that produce, producers get improved much more since the IBO came into the force. So as, as one of the aims of IBOs as well. So from this kind of setting, um, it seems that the, this fair representativeness of power within the IBO uh, seems to have an effect on prices as well. What is an issue um, maybe to discuss a bit more is uh, between processors and retailers where we observe this price margin three times higher. And uh, it must probably uh, have something to do with these um, auctions before or the way how they negotiate price. As Antonella already mentioned, there are some changes in this direction. So obviously it's recognized by, by everyone in the sector. So the analysis what we have actually show that uh, what the producers should get, it's mainly becoming more realistic, let's say, to IBOs. But... Um, yeah, retailer in any case have still strong power. So, yeah. From, from Thank you very much. We can move that. Thanks, Ivan. That's great. Um, can we move that question on to Lukash from your findings? Yeah, I, I fully agree with uh, Ivan and uh, what uh, we found in this uh, study. We can only complement the result. Uh, presented not only by Ivan, uh, but uh, also uh, is the pr uh, that uh, is. Uh, the presentation that was presented by Antonella today. And uh, we, we, we could observe that there was some change in two, uh, 2010, if we just talk about the uh, relation between the processor and farmer, and that it, uh, it was in favor of the farmer. But after the 2010, it, the situation was uh, again go, going worse and worse in terms of the re relation uh, or what the uh, processor pays for for the raw material to uh, to, to, to farmer. Uh, the question is uh, about also uh, in this case of the uh, uh, data data quality. What was the actual uh, change that rep represented the whole Italian sector? We could observe some change, but uh, if uh, the, the 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 change was so really so huge as uh, the da data uh, 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 sh show us in, 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 in our case, or if, if it was a little bit lower, it, uh, it uh, depends because still we have to, uh, we, we have to uh, uh, remember that we work with uh, accounting data and amount of data we don't we don't have the full uh, data set. We have uh, we work with unbalanced panel data set, but still, we can say that there was some positive change. But uh, this positive change was uh, 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 was uh, a little bit uh, 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 go going away like uh, that the situation went again uh, a little bit worse uh, through the time. So yeah, Thank you. that's like the relation between processor and the farmer. Thank you, Lucas. So we're, um, we've actually overrun. I've just got one more question uh, to ask, which I think, Rosa, if you're available, this might be, uh, you might be able to answer this question. If not, I throw it open to the rest of the panel. And that's a question about the packaging. Uh, to the extent to which um, there is research going on uh, looking at sustainable alternatives of packaging. And the question here is thinking particularly about met metal waste and um, in terms of the packaging, how that relates to consumer health as well. Is there anybody able to take feel that question on the panel?
present. I think Rosa is, uh, microphone is off. I think Rosa, if you, yes. yes, thank you, Rosa. Over to you, yeah. Rosa. Uh, I know that there are a lot of studies in packaging looking for more suitable um, recipes and more suitable um, available uh, packaging for uh, to avoid metal and to avoid um, harmful substances. Uh, we participate in, uh, in an European project uh, to develop a new um, resin to put into the cans um, without uh, bisphenol A, mm, that is uh, not allowed for, for the European community, and was uh, an important uh, project, um, but uh, was applied into the, the can. But now they are, uh, it's difficult to put uh, a new um, packaging because the tomato products have uh, a, a, a very low pH, is very acid, and uh, could make uh, damages in the packaging. For this reason, um, it's difficult to change the packaging, but they are looking for, um, some people are looking for um, new uh, um, functional and important uh, new packaging for this kind of product. Uh, thank you, Rosa. So, I'm clear that the European Union public policymakers are being looked to as um, helping uh, balance the values chain for processed tomatoes and probably, no doubt, for other food products. So. Celine started with her presentation and hopefully the, the initiatives which are coming into play on unfair trading practices and monitoring of price transparency will help uh, reach these goals. But it'll be interesting to see if we have any further interventions over the coming years. And it may be that some will arise from our stakeholder consultations in Volumix on uh, future scenarios for European food value chains. Celine has left, but I'd like to thank her for her participation and also the participation of all the panelists and indeed all of those of you who are able to uh, join us this morning and for those of you who have been able to stay as we've overrun our time. And finally, I'd very much like to thank FIAB, our host, the Spanish uh, Food and Drink Federation, for setting this up and for giving us the opportunity to present the project to interested uh, partners and stakeholders across Europe and within Spain. So if I hand back to um, Fia, perhaps I'd like to just close the meeting. So thanks, thanks to everyone. And uh, we would like to, to, to keep safe, of course, first of all. I would like to, to give our, our thank you mainly to Hilda and to Antonella, who are going to be, to be possible this, this event. And it's been a pleasure for, for, for us, for Fia. And it's been a pleasure to participate in Bubble Mix projects, of course, as, as usual. And well, uh, keep safe, everyone. Um, I hope uh, we can see you each other personally uh, as soon as possible. Um, thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.